and we are live. All right. So episode 18, I have Justin Julander of Australian Addiction, Reptiles, and a ton of other stuff, which I tried to list out in the Facebook uh, coverage of what the episode was going to be. Uh, so this podcast is kind of straightforward. It's me trying to let folks know more about people who are involved in the lizard side of herpeticulture and mm -hmm. how they are involved. You are involved in a bunch of facets of herpeticulture, <laughs> um, but you know, especially complete knobtail, you know, you're, you're very uh, involved in the lizard side, of course. And then you have a whole host of books uh, involved in the snake realm. So just kind of let folks know, you know, what's Australian addiction about and what is your, uh, angle into her pediculture, obviously with books and, and all sorts of things. So yeah, who are well, you? And what do you do? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Justin Julander from Australian Addiction Reptiles is yet. Um, so I'm from Utah. So I live in Northern Utah, almost to the border of Idaho. Uh, so it gets fairly cold in the winter. Uh, uh, but we, we've found ways to keep the reptiles warm and toasty during the winter. Uh, but it also helps to cycle them and stuff like that. So it's, a, it's a good place to live and we're pretty close to all the cool national parks and stuff in Utah. So I really enjoy living here. It's a good place to live. Um, so Australian addiction reptiles, I found that in uh, 1997. Uh, and as you can tell, I like Australian reptiles. And um, and around that time, uh, I figured out, hey, you can breed these things, you know, and, and, and so I kind of made a little side business out of it. I'd always uh, wanted to go into herpetoculture from a little kid up and, and thought that, or herpetology, I wanted to be a herpetologist. Um, but when the time came to, uh, you know, start grad school and things like that, um, it was actually my, my now wife uh, started asking questions about how, you know, I was going to support a family on a herpetolo herpetologist uh, uh, salary and what kind of jobs were out there. And I'm thinking, oh, I, you that know, I'm not sure. I just always, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so, you know, and I, I kind of thought a little bit more about it and thought, well, maybe I want to keep this as a hobby that, you know, I can be passionate about and excited about, but it doesn't turn into a job or work. I don't have to feed my family based on if I'm selling reptiles or not. So I just, I kind of made that choice and, you know, it's been a good one in some ways, but in other ways I'm thinking, man, maybe I should have done that. You know, maybe I, that would have been a, a good path to go on. And I see, you know, my friends working in the zoo industry and it looks like a, a lot of fun work, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, I, my salary is a little higher and, and I can do, right. have a little more freedom to do different things. And so, um, so I, I went into biology, into virology. So I study viruses, mostly uh, human uh, disease causing viruses and look for ways to prevent or treat those infections. And so that's kind of my day job. And then spend all my spare time thinking about reptiles and <laughs> going and looking for them in the wild and things like that. So, now, so. Did, is that what took you to Utah or are you from out there originally or how did that, is that because yeah, of I'm, work I, or? No, I'm, I'm originally from Utah. So okay. I, I grew up in about an hour and a half South of where we are now. And so, okay. um, yeah, this kind of took me up further North, but, uh, yeah, I, I was happy to stay in Utah. So when, when, uh, I finished my PhD, there was an opportunity, there was a position open in our group. And so I was, lucky to, you know, uh, compete for that and, and secure that position. And so I've been here since, okay. uh, yeah, since that time. So I started grad school in 1999. So I've been okay. up here for better. Part I was going to say, years. cause like that <laughs> it's hot and dry, but you get the cold. I mean, yeah. for trying to cycle Australian reptiles, you know, you hit it and yeah. yeah, that that's cool that you you're just from there and went to school there and, and you know, that all kind of lined up pretty perfect. Yeah. And I mean, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I had a fairly extensive collection by the time I finished uh, grad school and it would have been a little rough to try to go, you know, b do a postdoc, make 30,000 a year and, you know, have this collection right. of reptiles that I'm schlepping across the country somewhere. So, you know, I was really happy to kind of just slide into the the big money position, <laughs> if you if you can call it that uh, for a scientist, you know, we're not known for our mega wealth or anything, but, um, despite right. what all the conspiracy theories on Facebook say, <laughs> scientists yeah. are not, not rich and not making money off, you know, companies and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So, uh, 
it's mo mostly focused on pythons early on just because I didn't have a lot of time for lizards. I tried a mm -hmm. few lizard projects, had some early success with some knobtail projects and things like that. But mostly my my schedule was just conducive for uh, pythons and you know other snakes that were a little easier to, to manage with the grad student uh, schedule. For sure. But, yeah, now I'm trying to get some more uh, lizard projects. I, I I like all animals and nature in general, um, but you know my affinity for Australian reptiles kind of helps me limit what I keep and and try to focus right. on a specific group of of reptiles. But I mean that's a huge group. Australia's got a <laughs> lot of different reptiles, so mainly uh, pythons, skinks, and uh, uh, geckos. A couple monitors, but you know monitors are they require a lot of time and energy. And so right. I'm, I'm starting to rethink that maybe after I retire, I can do a few monitor projects, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what pushed Australia, what, what brought Australia to you that that was, that was it. Was there a yeah. species that you thought was cool and then you just kind of checked out more of it or is it the place itself? I, I think it's a, it's, it's multifaceted because I just, I, I love the, of course the reptiles there. And, you know, I think it was early on, you know, looking at my, uh, aunts and uncles, they had like all the encyclopedias and, you know, looking at the, the natural, you know, the reptiles one, the life reptiles, uh, yeah. edition or whatever. Uh, I just, you know, thumbing through that and seeing like a frilled lizard. I mean, that's kind of what really grabbed my attention. Uh, um, and then getting into, you know, pythons and things. I kind of stumbled across the carpet pythons and that got me really excited seeing, you know, a Centralian carpet python spread out on a red rock cliff overlooking a gorge. I'm like, okay, yeah, that looks like uh, Southern Utah. <laughs> and right. if I could find pythons on my hikes in Southern Utah, that would be fantastic. And so I just dreamed of being able to go over there and see, um, for sure. Some of the, some of the reptiles, but um, and then, you know, I found out there were people that actually kept and bred them in the U S and so I was able to, you know, track some species down and that a continual process as you know, as <laughs> kind of oh, gets yeah. in your blood and you want to collect them all, I guess. But, um, and, and I've, I've actually like, I think, you know, I get excitement for species as I go out and see them in the wild. So I've, I've mm -hmm. had been fortunate enough to make it over there about five times and, uh, see, I've seen quite a number of this, uh, Python species. So, uh, keep keep that tally going up uh, hopefully and go find some more uh, as soon as they open up and let us in. Uh, right. We actually had a trip plan for uh, 20, uh, 2019 or 2020. And then we had to cancel because of COVID. So that was a bummer. Yeah. But, so yeah. I, I think that's funny that, and I, and I, I said this to my wife when I was listening to the episode, when you, when you hear the NPR guys, they had talked about going to Australia and how, it, it, oh, it's, it's like going to Mars. It's so different. And it doesn't, you know, because they're East coast dudes. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that's what, that's their world, you know, that they're not used to that. But then I, I spent quite a bit of time in the Southwest and, mm -hmm. and I elk hunt in Idaho and, and all sorts of things. So yeah. when I hear people like you, you're like, no, man, that book looks like my house, but they <laughs> yeah. have pythons, you know, <laughs> exactly. and it, it makes way more sense to you because yeah. th that yeah. looks like where I'm from. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The canyons and gorges in you know, Western Australia and Central Australia are very similar to yeah. some of the stuff we got here. I mean, a little different and some, some different older rock, like it, Karajini, it's got all these iron rocks, you know, and so everything's red and, and sure. kind of square shapes. It's really kind of cool. So it's a little different, but I'm kind of used to the desert environment. I've, I've always loved deserts and always had my dad take me on backpacking trips into the desert. Cause I, I really, oops, sorry, really enjoyed, uh, desert uh backpacking um you know climbing rock climbing you know repelling that kind of stuff and so um and then you know finding reptiles on my trips was just you know icing on the cake but and then you know you thinking of going over there i think you know the landscape was fairly similar it wasn't too too big a shock i mean there's some really cool stuff to see out there that's different in, in a lot of ways to the things we have over here. But then sure. you're seeing like a, a parrot land on the, you know, the red rock or something. You're like, Whoa, I, I haven't seen that before. Or a fruit bat right. lands in a fig tree next to a, you know, a gorge in the middle of the desert. And you're like, yeah, that's new. <laughs> I, yep. I haven't seen that before. So that was, you know, that's really fun to see different, uh, parts of the world. I, I enjoy travel in general. You know, my job, uh, takes me to a lot of different places. So I've been fortunate enough to visit, okay. you know, Southeast Asia and in, in uh, Singapore and 
down oh, awesome. uh, uh, over in Europe quite a bit, you know, Spain and Portugal and, and Germany and some other places. So it's, you know, it's been nice to be able to travel to different, different places in the world, see different cultures, see different wildlife and nature. And yeah, sure. so I, I really love to travel. So talking about kind of field herping specifically, mm -hmm. uh, you, you come up quite a bit when you talk to folks in different podcasts and different parts of the reptile <laughs> world um, as being a pretty active field herper, obviously been to Australia quite a bit. Um, do you pretty routinely field herp around home or in, in the U.S. as able for a schedule, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the, the trade. It seems like I've almost spent more time in Australia than I have in my own backyard sometimes, just because when you make a trip over there, it's like almost not worth it unless you can spend a couple of weeks just because you right. spend three days traveling, you know? So if you're only going to spend a week there, half the time is going to be spent traveling and uh, the other half will be spent driving you know, <laughs> to different places because it's such a big spread out country. But um, I, I, you know, so I've, I've spent my first trip over there was almost a month and I, I oh, don't wow. know how, how I got away with that with work and stuff, but <laughs> I guess the, you know, research schedule is pretty flexible. I could kind of conduct things from the field a little bit. Um, so, but yeah, that was, that was a, a long time over there. That might've been a little too long, you know, to start missing <laughs> the family and stuff. And, and then my wife and I went over uh, to Western Australia and the East coast. And we were there almost or just over three weeks. Um, wow. so, you know, my trips over there have been quite long. So when you're intensively herping for, you know, three or four weeks at a time, you tend to rack up the hours and put on the, you know, the, the miles in the country. So, um, but I, you know, I try to get out as often as I can. Um, there's not a ton in my area. I mean, we've got the great basin rattlesnakes, uh, gopher snakes are quite common, different, you know, a couple different, uh, Themnopha species and, uh, rubber boas are fun to find, you know, see those, uh, you know, up in the hills occasionally and, you know, a few other cool species. I still have yet to find like a milk snake or a mountain king in Utah. They're a little trickier to find, but, um, you know, I, I try, I'm trying to spend more time, especially during the pandemic uh, in my own backyard right. and, and herping. My favorite part of Utah to herp is down in the southwest corner in St. George area. There's a lot of fun stuff out there. And I recently got into birding. So I, I've been down there a few times uh, birding before, you know, the herps were active. And yep. even when the herps are active, there's usually birds active as well. And so if you're not finding snakes or lizards, you're finding birds. So there's always sure. something to see. But yeah, I've always enjoyed uh, uh, herping, uh, field herping as much as I can. And even, you know, if we're just out on a hike or out, you know, I, I like to get in incidental herping just wherever I am, just keep an eye out for, you know, whatever I can find. So that was yeah. my wife and I literally driving back home. We're just talking about that, how she she isn't really much of a herper. Like mm -hmm. she she wouldn't go on a vacation to a place to find a, a key species. Yeah. Yeah. But we have tons of hobbies and spend lots of time outdoors and, yeah. and most of ours is incidental. Um, yeah. And yeah. it's, but it's still the same thing where, you know, like we stop, we, everybody's going to take a picture and see, yeah. you know, we're doing all the same things. It's just that the, the intent of the trip wasn't that activity. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, you know, enjoyable. If you can enjoy the landscape and the right. just every aspect of it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, if I don't find the snake, I'm going to have a miserable trip. Now, <laughs> right. maybe, the, maybe there's some places like that. If you, if you're targeting a certain species that lives out in the middle of nowhere in a barren, you know, lifeless field or something, and you, you find that, then you spend, spend a bunch of time in a boring environment that, you know, that I can see that. Uh, I, I might be crazy enough to do that once in a while as well, but most of my trips also have the idea of enjoying the landscape, doing some hikes in some cool places yeah. um, on, on the trip. To, and, and I think Rob Stone's very similar in that regard. We, we plan trips very similarly, you know, hikes during the day and then herping at night. So there's not right. much time to sleep, but you know, you sleep when you get back home, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. uh, we, we did a hike up, uh, it's called the Lost Mine Trail up in the um, Big Bend National Park. And um, I got to see my first wild bear. So that was pretty exciting, you know, and I'd, I'd never seen a bear in the, in the wild before. So that was really cool to see. And it was like 10 feet off the trail, <laughs> the base right. of a tree, just right there, you know? So that was kind of, kind of fun, kind of exciting, but a little intimidating when she's huffing at you and stomping and stuff. So. Yeah. The yeah. first time that happened to me was pretty terrifying. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, my, mine was in Idaho and uh -huh. I, the, the guy who was hunting with me, 
is in, is from there and was explaining to me like, hey, you know, there's bears here, so on and so forth. Really don't mess with them. You know, yeah. if there's cubs and <laughs> giving you all of the, you know, explanation of, of just how to be safe in, in that part of the country. I'm like, all right, yeah, cool. Yeah. And, and I had sort of just met him. We didn't really know each other that well. And he's mm-hmm. like, all right, I'm not messing around. There's actually a bear behind you. <laughs> wow. And I was like, dude, whatever, man. Like, <laughs> you, I didn't, I don't know why I thought, like, I'm not from there. I'm from yeah. Illinois. So, like, I yeah. just thought he was messing around. And he was like, look, dude, I don't know you, but you need to turn around. There's a bear. <laughs> like, and, yeah, no, there's totally a bear there. Wow. And, yeah, it is <laughs> it is one of those things where I was like, okay, um, I am not that fast. And that's <laughs> just right on down the trail, you, you know. And, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an intimidating thing, man. Yeah, yeah, they're they're big animals, and you know they they make their uh, living off of eating you know other big animals. So yeah, yeah. you could slow you could monkeys with no yep. claws or fur. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, but and and at the same time, I mean, you realize you know a lot of the the hype around them and things is probably not that warranted. You know, right. they're not that scary, especially like a black bear. I wasn't too fearful, but I mean, you don't still don't want to take a swipe from one, but right. and you know you don't want to mess or get too close or get in there safe space. This, this one had a cub as well. It was a tiny little cub. So I didn't want to get between her and her cub or try to make her feel threatened at all. So kind of kept my distance. And unfortunately I didn't get a lot of good pictures either. I just got kind of a crappy, <laughs> I think it may have uh, it, it I don't just know. been I, kind of through the tree, but it was, it was kind experience. of more of the experience thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it, but, I don't know that the way we do things in society now kind of colors us a little different for that stuff, you, you yeah. know, to where, yeah you almost feel like you had to tell us that oh, I didn't really get any pictures. And it's like, <laughs> no, that's okay, man. Like that's a super yeah. cool experience despite, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Selfie, we don't, you know? we don't need to take every <laughs> yeah, selfie of everything we had experience. <laughs> and sometimes it's nice just to, I, I don't know. There was that Walter Mitty show. I don't know if you saw that, but there was a, mm-hmm. a wildlife photographer in there and he's taking a picture of a snow leopard and he had it all set up and, snow leopard walked into frame and he didn't take the picture and he just enjoyed it for himself you know and and i think we got to do that sometimes i i was on a a trip to australia with some friends and and uh seemed like you know we needed to get everything in hand and get a what they call a wanker shot you know when you're holding the animal and i i just thought you know i don't necessarily need to get hands on it and i you know the previous year i'd gone with my wife and uh and mostly just photograph. I wasn't trying to catch things or hold stuff sure. or anything. I just try to film it from a distance and you get to see a lot more natural behaviors when you just kind of watch them do their thing in their natural environment. So That's I don't know. I'm kind of talking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little hard to get hands on a bird, but <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's the yeah. avian blasphemy. Exactly. That, that <laughs> those twitchers, aren't it? <laughs> but yeah, it's it, it's uh um so I you know I I don't necessarily feel like I need to get everything in hand anymore and I'm yeah. j- happy just to enjoy it, you know. It's uh, especially true of venomous snakes. I'm I don't know well, yeah. really what I'm doing with those, especially over in a different country and you you're, you know, hundreds of miles away from a hospital or something. Right. Got to be a little careful, yeah. Well, and that was uh, the of course, my wife and I were discussing this on the way home, um, <laughs> but that that was her thing was, you know, her explanation of it was because we do educational shows. Yeah. A lot of our stuff is hands on. Mm-hmm. And her her whole thought process was, well, this this is what I do and how I present these animals and interact with them. So if it didn't really make a ton of sense to her to go herping and then want to put your hands on a wild animal. Mm -hmm. She was much more of the, well, yeah, I mean, I would go take pictures or something like that, but I don't, I don't want to go pick them up. That's not what I do. You know, Mm -hmm. I could go to a zoo and interact with an animal physically. If I were herping, I just take photos or what have you. And that was what I was trying to explain to her. You know, that's much more birders and, and folks like that is that's the goal is to see it and see what it's doing. You know, yeah. wherever it is in, in that part of the world. And then of course, especially Australia and in, in different places where a ton of the stuff there, you really shouldn't put your hands on because they're very, very dangerous. <laughs> and it, you know, it just, it changes how you approach those things because then it's, Oh, it's a very nice picture and so on and so forth and backdrop or what have you, because you, you're not going to put that in the palm of your hand for a cool picture because yeah. of the, the danger involved. Yeah. And it, 
it just came to kind of make it made more sense to her, I guess. I think she's mm-hmm. one of those birder weirdos, but yeah. <laughs> um, no, you uh, you said we several times and, and talked mm-hmm. about your wife. Uh, does the family come with you, or is it more of like a vacation thing, and then the herp is incidental, or, or how does that work? <laughs> a lot of those have been non-volunteer uh, missions, <laughs> going out and looking for reptiles. But you know, I think the kids get excited about. It. I, so I have I have five kids. I have my son's the oldest, and then four daughters. And and uh, actually, my youngest uh, was really excited about going herping recently, and she's gotten into helping me in the reptile room and stuff. So she's given me an excuse to get out and go herping. So uh, awesome. Uh, trying to find you know ways to take her out and let her find some stuff so um that's been fun she got to hold the big old gopher snake the other night when we were out uh, herping in you know down a few hours south made cool. for a late late night coming back but yeah she she was really excited and had a good time with it so it's fun to see her be excited and i think all my kids have been pretty excited uh they're always you know begging to go help me at the reptile shows or or and right. we usually go out you know road cruising or something at nights if we're in in an area where we could find something fun so they've been on a lot of late night drives and <laughs> and uh the long routes you know to our destination so we can herp along the way yep. um sometimes they're not very happy about it and other times they're pretty excited about it but you know when you find something cool and you get to show it to them they get pretty pretty excited about it we were just out in uh, uh southern california and you know they wanted to go there for the beach and stuff but we we had a we tacked on a few days up front in the desert out in uh brago springs area and uh, cool. ocotillo we actually stayed on uh, the lizard ranch uh, on uh, um alan rapashi's land out in ocotillo yeah and, yeah, he's planning on building the full like uh, Airbnb type experience for herpers. So it's kind of a cool oh. place. And there's a lot of fun species out there. So we, you know, saw a ton of sidewinders and the kids just had a blast. Like, you know, they kind of getting startled when the sidewinders would take off and they're for pretty sure. fast when they get going. So <laughs> and, and rattling, you know, they're jumping out of the way and laughing and stuff. So it was pretty fun. Um, we found, you know, a few different species. We took out Alan's uh, daughter with us and, and, uh, his, and her, uh, uncle actually, who's about the same age. So (laughs) it was pretty fun to, to go out and see some of that or her, her nephew. That's what it is. So Cheryl and her nephew are about the same age, but, um, had a fun time uh, herping with those guys as well. And found, you know, some banded geckos, a horn lizard, found a shovel nose snake one of the nights. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's cool. I do enjoy getting the family involved. I, I do remember our my wife and my trip to Australia. We um, got there, you know, and, and the first night we were getting ready to go out road cruising, you know, go herping at night. And and uh, and then, like, she's like, oh, you know, that was fun. And then the next night I'm like, okay, you ready? And she's like, oh, wait, we're doing it again? And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're doing it every night. Like, yep. that's why we're here. <laughs> yep. so, yeah. It was kind of a little bit of a shock to her. And, you know, it wasn't her uh, dream vacation necessarily. And I think if I, if I'm, if I take her back, if she is willing to go back with me again, it will be a different experience. You know, we'll stay in a, in a hotel here and there to clean up a little, cause she was a trooper, man. We were just out camping in Western Australia for basically over just over two weeks. And, you know, we just, okay shower maybe two or three times during that period or go swim in the ocean or something. So, I mean, it was beautiful and we had a lot of cool experiences out oh, in nature, yeah. but it's pretty remote out there and not a lot yeah. going on. So, but in retrospect, I, sh- I would have planned, you know, a, a hotel stay here and there. And back then we couldn't really afford it. So we, right. we I mean, that's, it yeah. makes a big deal. Yeah. We got a hippie van and, you know, had, had a yes. bed in the back and just kind of folded down the bed at night. And so it worked out pretty well. That was, that was my concession to, you know, to having her sleep out in the desert. She didn't want to really tent it. And that was my plan right. was to sleep in a tent. And so she's like, how about we do this? I'm like, okay, it's not as expensive as hotel rooms. And so we can For sure. make that happen. But yeah. So it, but awesome. I, I really enjoy herping with the family. It just, and actually Heidi was much better herping companion. My friends, they'd fall asleep at the drop of a hat and she would stay up with me, keep me away. She was afraid I was going to like uh, crash the car or not pull right. off to the side enough and get plastered, you know, the car run over by a semi or something. So she was always like, yeah, I'll, I'm going to stay awake and help you stay. Awake. I'm like, you can just go to sleep in the back. She's like, no, no, I'm going to stay awake with you. And <laughs> so she was really good and she'd spot stuff, you know, and, and so it was, awesome. pretty, it was fun. 
she really so, wanted to see a thorny devil. So we, we found two of them. So she was just over the moon real? and really excited about it. Yeah. We were cruising along this freeway, at, you know, we we're going about 60 miles an hour and I saw something kind of out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, that looked like a lizard. I think that was a thorny devil. So we swung around and it was, and she's like, how did you see that? <laughs> and then Whoa. we, we went maybe a, a half a mile up the road and there was another one on the road. So I'm like, this is too cool, you know? And I haven't seen wow. a, a live one aside from those two that we saw in you know a matter of a few minutes from each other so <laughs> it's pretty fun wow that's, that's awesome the, yeah that's the downside of herping over there is seeing these road killed species that you've dreamed of seeing your whole life and then you're well, seeing them right. dead i i still haven't seen a live centralian blue tongue skink or a western blue tongue skink in the wild yet so i need to that's what keeps me going back i guess seeing those target species that i haven't seen i've seen a lot of them dead but not not any alive right. yet so yeah and yeah. it's just you know what's normal for where you're from you know yeah. and Exactly. I, I was talking to Scott and Ty and mm -hmm. you know, for them, they're like, Oh, do you know how cool like garter snakes are or whatever, you know? And then, yeah. and then I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and like, <laughs> no, you have like 40 different kinds and it's, it's totally different from our stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I know I'm, I'm from here, you know? Yeah. And it, yeah. but then we're the same way. Like, you yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. dragon's the coolest thing ever. And they're like, it's a, <laughs> it's a fence lizard, man. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. You know. Yeah. They call carpets crap. It's so, yeah. like, yeah, they're one to talk Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard him use that term a time or two, but yeah. right. Well, I, I remember in Western Australia, we, we'd gotten back from there and we went to the scales and tails festival in, in Ipswich, uh, where and and scott's fairly local so he was at the show and i and i said yeah we saw this weird venomous snake out there i'm not sure what it was and i showed him a picture he's like oh you blankety blank <laughs> he had some words for me but it, it was a, a spotted uh black snake uh the uh, i i'm failing on the scientific name right now but he'll probably i'm sure he'll chime in but yeah he he was a little upset that i saw one of those in the wild before he did it <laughs> right but yeah very very uh cool it, it was a it was one of those weird experiences where you're i was watching it and taking pictures and and filming it you know we we just kind of seen it uh walk or crawling across the dirt road at night and and i was like yelling for my wife to grab the video camera and i kind of took my eyes off it and then i looked back and i i couldn't find it <laughs> i'm looking everywhere and it was kind of a smaller animal and so mm -hmm. maybe, you know maybe darted down a hole when i wasn't looking but yeah I, it just disappeared i'm like well at least i got one or two pictures that you could identify right. it. yeah so and i think that's funny like that you know, we kind of treat it the same way. Right. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you talk to nipper or you talk to the ipers and folks like that, and they're like, you know, Oh, how, how many rattlesnake species have you guys seen in, in the States? And, and for most of us, it's, it's just a few. Yeah. And there are bunches for us to see. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, if we visit them or, or talk to them, it's the same way. And it's like, well, you know, how many, how many carpets have you guys interacted with in the wild? And depending on where they live, they're like, oh, well, you know, I see coastals all the time because that's where I'm from. And it's like, oh, well, have you ever seen, you know, the other types? And they're like, oh, no, I just, you know, whenever I go over to that county, I'm hanging out at my buddy's house or at work or, you know, it, it's the exact same yeah. thing. Yeah. It's just yeah. that they're from the place that we think is super cool, yeah. you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We, we all have, I mean, yeah, I, I, but I, I do think I appreciate our local herbs and I, I, I'll tell you, I never get sick of seeing desert tortoises down in South and I've seen, yes, you know, probably close cool. to a hundred of them. You know, I've, I see them every time I go down there and it will at least if they're active, but yeah, they're, they're just fun to see. I, I enjoy finding one no matter what. And I, I don't care if I've seen 12 that trip, I'll sit and take pictures and, mm -hmm. and watch it and see what it does, you know, and they're, they're a lot of fun. So I, I, uh, I, I think I do have a, and I think everybody's kind of got their thing. Like I, I'm not into rat snakes at all. I can't get excited about corns and rats and things like that. They just don't do it for me. And I don't know why, you know, I appreciate them and I think they're cool and I wouldn't mind seeing them in the wild, but I'm not going to go to a place to target those species. You know, if right. I see them 
you know, looking for other stuff. Great. If not, I'm okay with that. You know? So I think we all have our, you know, kind of the things we like and the things we don't necessarily care that much about. And, and I think we all get maybe a little <laughs> offended or testy if people don't like the same things we do, you know, yeah. why, don't, why aren't you ex more excited about this? This is really cool. You know, well, okay. for sure. <laughs> yeah. I feel well, bad for the guys who are into like blind snakes or, you know, those really, uh, nondescript yeah, boring. Right. Yeah. But they, really they could Sicilians. be really cool. Yeah, exactly. What? You never see them, but <laughs> yeah. You like uh, giant earthworms? Like, oh, okay, cool, man. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think there's value to, to all animals. And I, you know, like I said, I get excited about seeing just about anything, a cool bug or a spider or something, you know, is just as fun as seeing a, a big mammal or a bird, but um, some get me a little more excited than others. And, you know, sure. reptiles definitely fall into that and especially Australian, you know, pythons and, and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, of sense though, that uh -huh. the place that, I mean, it's, it's in the name, right? Like the, the part of the world that interests you the most. Yeah. Really. Most of those pythons kind of fill the role of being giant rat snakes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. that they're pythons. They're pretty unique looking and, the you know morelia as a whole kind of have their own thing going on and so it it would kind of make sense that given you know where you're from where you spend a lot of time out in the environment and then the interest you have in australia american rat snakes probably aren't that high on the list because you've already found your semi-arboreal not too big but big enough to be cool snake yeah yeah and yeah uh, All right. Well, me. that's what rat snakes are, you know, uh, like exactly. The, yeah. 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 You kind of already filled that role for yourself. And so yeah. you have your thing. Yeah. That, I mean, that and makes I, sense. I think we, we each have our, you know, uh, what floats our boat and, you know, the form or the function or the pattern or whatever it may be. For sure. Um, the, the cool natural history, you know, uh, that those all kind of play into it, but I think, you know, we, that's, that's okay. We can all have our own, uh, tastes and enjoyment and we shouldn't get it get upset if people don't like the same things we do but right yeah yeah i i think it's funny when groups war with each other you know like oh our species is better than yours or you should keep ours because they're better you know it's like eh, what's what I, how do you yeah yeah it's funny. i've never understood it <laughs> yeah it, it is it's one of those things where like it i get it when they're uh retic bros or like uh, ball pythons are dumb or whatever <laughs> like yeah there, there's like funny things like that where sure. yeah like i Just don't actually hate part of the people or whatever, you culture. know yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and then there's the no really like you should do this as a that's just very <laughs> weird yeah. Um, but what I, you know, what was kind of shocking to me is I got that uh, Marco Shea book, the the snake book. It's up there somewhere. Yep. Yeah, the, the the book of snakes. But yes. <laughs> and and just looking through that and realizing, man, I don't know jack about snakes. Like there's yes. so many species, I have no clue. Even we're out there, and you know, and and there's, uh, I'm you know, I'm not saying I'm that knowledgeable. I I kind of have my own little area where I have some knowledge, but you know, there, there's so much to learn and so much to know. And I look at that, I'm like, man, there's a lot of cool snakes out there that I would love to see or learn about, or, you know, and you look at them and it's like most of them eat frogs or other snakes. Yeah. And you know, how many snake specialists there are was really shocking to me. I'm like, man, there's no wonder these aren't kept or in, in captivity. Yeah. Cause you know, you don't want to be feeding the thing you like to the other things you like, you know, it's kind of yep. a, tricky thing that way but well and then what i loved about that book so when i was when i was reading through that and i was of course just word vomiting to my wife all this cool stuff that i had read <laughs> and and she's like yeah i get it you know there's a ton of snake species in the book that's great blah 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 <laughs> and i was like no no you don't understand that that book is you know as thick as my forearm yeah. it's huge yeah and then some of the accounts in that book he has one animal to cover a genus. Yeah. And yeah. he's like, Oh, well there's a whole bunch more, but I didn't put them in the book. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I was like, I was like, dear, this book is that thick. And he has said in here multiple times, Oh, Hey, there's a bunch more. I just didn't cover them. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. That's how many more that I, yeah. I didn't even get to see a picture of those. And I didn't know the first one existed. Yeah. It you blows know? the mind. Yeah. You're like, wait a second. There's a whole family of these. There's yeah. I didn't even really realize that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That's For sure. Amazing stuff. But, and that's, so, you know, that's the beauty of it. There's always something new to experience or new to learn. There's so much areas for, for growth and education. And that's, what's right. A lot of the, 
lot of the fun about this. And that's kind of what's gotten me into birding is that, you know, I thought, oh, there's sparrows and there's crows. And, you know, I, I knew a few species, but then getting into it and seeing how diverse the number of species are and they kind of come and go in the state. And so, I mean, I, I just started this year. My dad kind of challenged me to a big year. My dad and my cousin got me into this and, and, uh, they kind of made it a competition and there's so many nice. like supporting apps and things that you can get oh, that yeah. help you identify things and record and, and, you know, track your, your species count and things like that. It's really kind of fun and it gets addicting. And uh, I, you know, I'm up to like almost 230 species within this year that I found within mm -hmm. my, you know, mostly within my state that I had no clue or even around. And it's, it's right. kind of fun that way. You know, it's, it's like the, the big book of snakes, you know, learning about all these different species <laughs> that you didn't even know were out there or a possibility. I love learning about new animals. I, that, that series on planet earth, when the Galapagos iguanas were running mm -hmm. the gauntlet of the snakes, that yeah. was probably some of the most amazing reptile footage I've ever seen. And I just like, who knew that it was even a thing, you know, thank goodness right. that, People yeah, get a bunch out of us that are that. nerds for that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know they had it racer snakes. Yeah, you, you right? know, and that I, that would no eat, clue. you know, marine iguanas. You're like, wait yeah. a second, that's not right. How did that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I so think the cool. birding uh, angle that you are seeing a lot more folks in herpeticulture kind of also trend that way, and then how it it's it's kind of become more popular just in general. Yeah. A lot had to do with COVID and folks just wanting to be outside and things yeah. like that. But yeah. it for people who are already into herpeticulture and then kind of get into the field herping a little bit or just have a ton of like other outdoor hobbies or activities and things, it mm -hmm. that's the most prevalent form of wildlife is it, you just yeah. always see, you know, ah, birds are here. And it it's kind of background noise. We mm -hmm. don't, you know, I'm going herping to find this snake or i yeah. want to see this turtle or you know, have the app on your phone trying to figure out which frog is calling and and, and things like that mm -hmm. and it just never occurred to some of us that there probably also is a phone an app on your phone that does that for birds yeah and, yeah. and you better know apps. And, <laughs> and more oh, thorough yeah, apps yeah they've been doing it for way longer than us oh yeah and it's much more it's, organized if you already have an interest in the outside world and you already have outdoor hobbies and, and all those things like it just seems like a natural progression to mm -hmm. these things are always in my environment. I always see them, but I don't even know what that is. Like, and yeah. to finally have that, I want to know what this is moment because mm -hmm. you, I don't know. It, it just seems like you're trying to get more into the details yeah. and, and that people yeah. who spent a ton of time outside in their life anyway, it kind of felt like you were treating it like that was supposed to be the thing, right? Is like, I want to get yeah. away from all this, noisy stuff in modern life and hang out outside and then you still kind of treated some of it like background noise <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. It, it defeated the purpose of what you thought you were doing in, in nature uh -huh. and now it's become much more important to people and much more popular to find out what that stuff is and yeah. it, it just seems like a really natural segue into it mm -hmm, for sure and i you know i i think uh the just the appreciation, like some things don't stick, you know, like I'll, I'll my dad's a, into botany. And so he'll tell me all the plants when we're on our backpacking trips and, and then he'll quiz me, you know, 10 minutes later, what's that? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I've already forgotten. You know, it just doesn't stick very well. Like animals do. I don't know. Animals just sure. kind of stick in my head, but I love these apps like iNaturalist where you can get on there and just put in a picture of some plant right. or what other. And, and the app does a pretty good job of helping identify it. And then if the app makes missed out, then, you know, you've got experts on there helping you figure out yeah. what you're seeing. So I just think it adds another layer of appreciation of, of the world around you. And, you know, you can just be walking around, go, that's a weird looking plant, or that's a cool looking bug. I want to know what that is. I want to know more about that. And, mm -hmm. and to, you know, get the scientific name and look up more, you know, and see what kind of things that thing does. It's, it's pretty uh, cool, cool way to interact with the wild. And I think that's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of 
uh, improved with technology at the same time, it's declining, you know, in a lot of people with technology because they're more indoors and they're not getting out and appreciating that. But like you said, the pandemic has kind of forced people outside and yep. given them a reason to go explore or get out and learn something new because they're so sick of being indoors and stuck uh, doing stuff. So yeah, it's pretty. Well, and I think especially for stuff like iNaturalist is mm -hmm. that is what, people in the 80s 90s when they were talking about like sci-fi tech and how tech is going to help improve our lives right yeah and yeah. and there's like memes and jokes about that you know i have <laughs> all the knowledge of human history in my pocket and i use it to look at pictures of cats and argue with strangers <laughs> on the internet you yeah. know and, and how it feels like a wasted opportunity but then something mm -hmm. like iNaturalist it is the is the culmination of that right Mm -hmm. is I'm curious about some part of the natural world. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Then you might not have been able to act on it because you couldn't take a picture of the plant and then go look it up at the library or yeah. you, you, you didn't have a way to act on the fact that you were curious about that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And now you have an app that's, that's cool. I want to yeah. know. Yeah, and it took a helped. lot more effort to research things and figure right. out what things were. Yeah. But we to take have it for that granted. resource is, mm -hmm. is one, yeah, it's one of those things where it, we do take it for granted a little bit now, but mm -hmm. just the fact that that exists is people like kind of make fun of the current generation of kids, right? Or you just Google yeah. anything, you, you know, yeah. and it, that feels like something where, it's kind of like not fair that I didn't have it when I was growing up, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you get that little bit of like a resentment feeling. And, <laughs> but then you, if you were to talk to someone who grew up in that, what, what I always have talked to my kids about is like, you should be the most knowledgeable, well-rounded, diversified generation of people ever. Yeah. Because you can, you can know anything yeah, yeah you can you could google anything mm -hmm. if you have a question about any facet of life you can google it yeah, yeah and so that knowledge is there that's amazing and then instead of like don't resent them for it you know tell them to, yeah man go yeah. go be Enjoy a genius it. yeah like that's it. that's awesome yeah, I, this, I wish I this, was that smart. <laughs> at the same time, though, you've got in, in your in the same device, you've got all the distractions in the world coming yes. along with it. Yep. And that's that's difficult because it's a lot easier to be entertained yes. than it is to learn. You know, yep. and, and and I, you know, I'm guilty of this. I think, I, you know, we, we rag on the up and coming generation, but I think our generation is just as guilty oh, yeah. a lot of the times with their heads in their phones and, you know, constantly, you know, looking at the the discussion boards or seeing who's yep. liking their pictures or whatever, you know, we, we get into that as well. And I think, you know, it's, it's a little hypocritical to, to condemn the younger generation for that yep. behavior when we see it in ourselves. But, you know, you're right. I think, you know, everybody should be excited about these technologies and the opportunities to learn because, I don't know about you, but I got a ton to ton to learn as well. And, you know, oh, not yeah. as many years as some of these younger people and my brain's a little mushier than theirs too. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. that's what I love about stuff like iNaturalist and things like that, where, you know, you, you end up becoming the reptile guy in your group of friends who aren't mm -hmm. into that, you, you know, and yeah. there's, there's mm -hmm. whole jokes about that on the internet. Like you get a Facebook message from somebody mm -hmm. you haven't seen in years and it's yeah. like, what's, yeah. what snake question do you have? You yeah, know, like that's true. why you're messaging yeah. me, you know, exactly. either it's somebody had you a found... baby, somebody passed away, or you found a snake in your backyard. What, <laughs> yep. which, uh, you know, and, uh, but now so it's, yeah, man, I, I don't know everything in Mark O'Shea's book. I, mm. I have no idea, but we could reverse image search it and yeah. probably find out what that weird bug is, you mm -hmm. know, or, yeah. or whatever it is. Like that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff, like even the experts don't really know, you know, they've only found one or two right. specimens. And so, you know, and you think, man, there's just so much to learn and so much to do. And, and uh, it's what's sad is, you know, there's not a lot of funding for that, you know, the research uh, researchers yes. out there. And I, but I do think that's an opportunity for us, you know, to study things in our own backyard and to make inroads and discoveries and things where, 
people that have to rely on funding to do those studies don't have that luxury sometimes. And if we're out there anyway, looking at them, I, I was, we had a herp, some of the East coast guys out here for herp trip. And I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to tag along. So, um, Rob Christian, uh, from nerd, he was out here and, and taking pictures and, and like measuring temperatures and logging, you know, all this information. I'm like, Oh, you know, you gotta write an article. Are you going to write something? Oh no, I'm just, doing it because i'm curious i'm like well <laughs> don't you think somebody else is curious about that too you know right as long as you're as long as you're writing it down write a little article put put that data out there for other people to enjoy you know it's it's interesting information somebody else is you know keeping a desert tortoise or a, a you know a rattlesnake or something that might come in handy to have the actual temperatures when they were active you know what what kind of temperatures they're out in and what kind of conditions they're in and where they're found and you know, those kind yeah. of things are well, useful that's the thing for is people. When, when that information, especially if it's put out electronically, right, as opposed to paper, yeah, uh, it, it's forever. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's mm -hmm. searchable, mm -hmm. you know, which is such a key thing is yeah. people might not have access to, you know, whatever magazine or, or what have you that maybe mm -hmm. you wrote something for. Yeah. And, if it goes digital and goes online, it is, you know, kind of a byproduct of society that we were just talking about. Most people mm -hmm. can Google it and <laughs> most people can yeah. look it up, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it just makes that information available to so many more people that probably have a lot of the same interests as you mm -hmm. and may never go where a desert tortoise lives. Yeah. You and you're, I mean? and you're just, putting it in terms that they can understand and for they sure. can appreciate. And, um, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of that. Even if it's not, you know, published in a scientific journal or something, just put it on your webpage or put it on a discussion board or put it somewhere where people can look at it and save it and, you know, download it and, and save it for future reference or whatever. I mean, that's, yeah. that's useful regardless of how, wide your audience is or how professionally done it is and how anecdotal it is. It doesn't matter. You know, just get the information out there. And I, I'm guilty of that too. I'm not putting all that in for, I, I should probably be doing the same thing. He is, you know, taking my <laughs> temperature gun and my UVometer or whatever and, and recording these, these data for, uh, I, I could be better at that too, you know, and I, sure. I don't have much of an excuse. I'm a scientist. I should be doing that. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you do though, share quite a bit of information with folks uh because <laughs> you are an author as well so yeah. <laughs> you have shared a great deal of information with a lot of people uh so talk to folks about your books because they are awesome and i have several of them and i'm very <laughs> excited about that well, thank you. Yeah, that's that's nice of you to say. I, I, I just you know, I'll admit it. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants because what we're doing is taking you know all the published information, any kind of reports or anecdotes or whatever about the different species, and you know, it's usually species I'm interested in in herpetoculture, and so I'm like, you know, I I, I want to keep those, so I start researching them and I write down what I'm researching, and then it eventually just kind of becomes a book sometimes. And uh, so that's been part of the motivation is for me to learn about them, A. And then um, as a, a research professor at a university, I have access to not only my library, but, you know, in the age of digital technology, I can get articles from any other library around the world through my library. And so I have access to all these um, publications. And so uh, another uh, factor of my day job is that I write publications. I've authored over 70 scientific publications right. in virology and, you know, a couple in herpetology as well uh, and, and herpetoculture as well. And uh, and so I've got that experience reading those papers and, and trying, you know, some some I don't understand very well, you know, and it takes me a few times reading, especially taxonomy. That stuff's just mumbo jumbo. But <laughs> I uh, <laughs> try try my best to understand what the papers, you know, what the findings are and, and right. how to interpret that or put that in easily uh, understandable terms and then kind of 
mixing it together with what else is known and, and putting together a nice picture of what we, the knowledge we have about different species. And that, you know, that increases and grows as we move along. And so, you know, we're, we're working on a second edition of the complete carpet python and yes. it's probably going to be twice as long as the first edition. And it's almost a new book and all the information that we've added and, and new information that we've gleaned and new, uh, you know, information that we've come up with or, or ideas that we've come up with um, that hopefully some scientists down the road will test and, you know, put to the test and check out. But um, I'm really excited to get that out there. And uh, we had a little, another delay, you know, we'd planned to have it out by Tinley, but um, we had, uh, we were working with Warren Booth to run some uh, DNA sampling and, and look at some oh, of the okay. structure within the group of carpet pythons, how they're related to each other and things like that. And so we didn't think that was going to happen because things were so delayed with COVID. But, and so we were to the point where we're saying, okay, man, sorry, we got to move forward with this. And then right at the last minute, he's like, okay, I got the data <laughs> and we're analyzing it. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. So we're, awesome. we're putting, putting things on hold a little bit to get that data in the, in the book and get his uh, take and analysis and on the, on the data that we've generated into the book, you know, uh, just another piece yeah, but of man, the puzzle. If, if you, you know? got to wait, that's, that's a yeah, right? solid reason to wait. You know, that's <laughs> exactly. not, Oh, we were changing the font or something like, no, that's <laughs> yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, primary data basically. And so, and, and he's doing pretty, you know, detailed analyses and things. So it could, could uh, bring some insights into our knowledge awesome. about the interrelatedness of carpet pythons. So I, you know, I hope, I hope it's appreciated. It is a, a labor of love and, you know, we really don't make <laughs> much money on this. It's, it's a matter of, you know, if we, logged our hours and looked at how much money we make per hour right. it would probably be pennies you know so it's not about making money or or selling books or anything it's about getting knowledge out there and and you know like i said we're we're basing a lot of this on other people's work and other people's research and and a lot of uh, good contributors of photographs and things like that they're generally sure. donating those photos for the for the book and so um, with with no thought of anything in return, so that's really uh, uh, a nice collaboration, I guess. Uh, I you know I hate to take too much credit for it because we're we're basing a lot of this on other people's work, but you know it's it does take a bit to put put such a work together. So it is yeah. it is fun to to get out there. I'm excited to have it done. <laughs> I just think it's so for for folks that are listening who are are more of a lizard nerd. Uh, mm -hmm. The complete carpet python, the the first go round when that came out was considered, and is considered, still, the, like the definitive book about carpet pythons. It it the way that folks in her pediculture talk about it is like, this is it. Y you know, <laughs> it was it was the work, and then to hear you and to hear Nick have have talked about it now for some time, of Oh no, we we rewrote chapters and we added so much <laughs> and and there was just so much more information and and updated things and things that changed and I just think it's incredible that you know her pediculture as a whole was like it's done we did it <laughs> we know it we, all <laughs> we yeah. wasn't us but we did it you know <laughs> and then for you guys who were actually doing it came around for the second time you're like no man that's not even close but we're we're doing more you know yeah. <laughs> and it and significantly more to to hear you and nick talk about it over the last couple months is it's it's a lot you, you know a, a great deal of work a great deal of information things have been writ rewritten and, and so on and so forth and i just like it, we we don't know a lot of stuff about reptiles yeah. <laughs> and it yeah. feels like we know a lot about reptiles. And then when you, <laughs> yeah. when you start to get into it, it we, we don't. And it, yeah. that's awesome. I think that's really cool because that there's just so much more to do. Like there's so yeah. much work to be done mm -hmm. that you random person, her pediculture, just pick one, pick one of those facets and start going because there's a whole lot of work to do. So yeah, there will always yeah. be something for you to in endeavor toward. <laughs> the, the, the 
I guess the beauty or the pain of it all is the more you learn, the more you learn, you don't know much. And so <laughs> yes. the more, the more questions you answer that also, uh, multiplies the questions you have. So you might get an answer to one question, but that builds three or four new questions. And so, you know, that quest for knowledge is just never ending. And so, mm -hmm. and there's always something else you can figure out or learn about, you know, we think, oh, we've got to figure it out with atoms, you know, it's, uh, neutrons, electrons, and protons, and that's it, you know, and, oh, wait, now you can break those down into smaller and smaller pieces. And okay, now there's all these weird neutrinos or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it just keeps going, you know, and, and there's, there's, oh, just, yeah, and electrons don't do any of the stuff you think that they do. <laughs> yeah, 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 there, there's For no sure. end to what we can figure out and learn about things. And especially, you know, I, I guess that was my big drive to write a book is, you know, I'd get reading different uh, books or works and there just wasn't a lot on their natural history. You know, what are these things doing in the wild? That's what really fascinates me and interests me and was ma my main focus in these books was trying to, you know, put those, put that information out there and put that together. And, um, so learning about those things, but then you're thinking, well, okay, we know this much, but you know, I want to know this much, or I want to know this much or whatever, you know, you just keeps going and keeps going. So that's the, that's the joy of nature is you can keep learning as much as you want to learn and, and there's no end to it. You know, you, you never get to that point where I'm okay, we're done. We're, we found mm -hmm. it. We, we know it all now. We're, we're all knowing. So <laughs> yeah. What a fun labor that is though, to, to learn and to grow. So. Yeah, I'd so, encourage everybody to do that. <laughs> Learn more. Yeah. Do you think, um, how do I verbalize that? Do you think, or this is the impression I get, okay, uh -huh. is your your work in the sciences, so I, coming from, my, my degree's in biology, and then I went to a, a master's program, and when I was in my master's program, it I was in a lab where the student who was about to graduate had done this one set of research. And then my research would be like the next set based off the yeah. question. You know, he yep. had found, uh, it was in neuroscience and he had found this mm -hmm. um, evidence involving plaques in the brain. And then mm -hmm. I was going to move on. Okay. The plaque is there and now we're going to do the next question. Yeah. And it, it, they, they build off each other in a lab mm -hmm. like that and, and how the questions are going to continue and experiments and things like that. Yeah. And then when I hear you talk uh, about something like the book and, and you're very like the first thing you just did was to say a lot of other people did this work and we were compiling other people's work and it takes a great deal of effort to do that. And that is its mm -hmm. own work. And, and yeah. you had to put a lot of work into that, but a lot of the information, you know, for natural history, you, you weren't discovering the natural history. You were compiling yeah. it for all the rest of us to read. And mm -hmm. that was your effort in the project, yeah. right? Uh, that, it, that became a book. Yeah. And then maybe you did your own research or now you're working with Warren and doing research. Yeah. And, and those are new things. Mm -hmm. But a big portion of the book itself is probably a compilation of things that were known separately throughout history and her pediculture. And now you and Nick and you all put it together and now goobers like us can read it and <laughs> it do you think that because you are in a career field and you work in that way and that kind of colors it a little bit and that it i don't know it just seems like the, the way that you talk about it i i would have already assumed that you probably have worked in a, a lab or a working group <laughs> the way that i did when i was in school yeah because that is how that's how it was approached. Like I, right? I yeah, went to you... my professor and he was like, Oh, well, this is my student. So-and-so, and he's working on this. And now you're going to come in and here's the next step. And our mm -hmm. lab is going mm -hmm. to do this. You two yeah. are just doing these jobs mm -hmm. and then we'll give you a degree at the end of it. If you're good. <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, and it, yeah. it's, it's a cumulative process over time. Yeah. And it really is almost never done. Mm -hmm. that yeah. some other student farther on down, they'll just keep doing portions of the question as, as they go. Yeah. The, the guy in the office next to mine, I think he's 80 in his late eighties and he's still working and because, 
because they keep giving him grants. You know, he's like, yeah. I can't stop. I'm like, well, there's a way to not apply for those grants. You don't have to apply. You can just right? re retire and enjoy. Your I, I don't think he enjoys spending time with his wife or something because he's there on you know campus all the time. But anyway, he's and he's you know an authority and he's doing good work and so they keep funding him and you know that's kind of how it goes sometimes. But yeah, there's there's no end to it. You can just keep looking down the same, you know, going down the same avenue and finding new and, you know, interesting things. And especially in areas we just don't understand a lot, like neurology, you know, that's a really big area and, and got a lot of uh, potential to, to discover new things. And so I think it's the same with the natural world, you know, and, and yeah, I, I you know, when you get into your, your graduate degree or something, you, you go, okay, what I, I need to learn, this is kind of my area, you know, so now I'm going to learn all I can about what's been discovered so far in that area. And so you get into literature and you start making summary, you know, uh, papers and, you know, and your, your thesis or your dissertation has, you know, that first, first uh, chapter is your uh, data dump, you know, all the things that have been discovered in that topic and that area. And you kind of have to know those things. That's the basis of your knowledge, you know? And so that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing a summary, you know, we're doing what's known in, in these, with these animals and then maybe adding a couple ideas to that. You know, I had a couple epiphanies doing this book and thinking, wait a second, this relates to this, which may, maybe is the reason for this, you know? And so I've got some kind of novel thoughts and ideas out there. At least I think they're novel. So I'm excited for some feedback on some of these ideas that I've had while, while writing the book and putting this together. And I don't want to put out any spoilers. So, we'll, you know, you'll have to wait till the book comes <laughs> out, but trying to figure out what, uh, you know, how these things are working together and how things are, why they are and how they got to be that way. And so that's kind of been fun, you know, to have those ideas and say, Hey, wait, this fits with this. And wow, the look at that, that fits almost too perfectly together. You know, well, that makes sense because of this aspect of their natural history, you know? So it's, it's really exciting to not only compile all the information, but kind of take the next step or make new formulate new hypotheses or, or, you know, information. Now it's hard to get over there and research them because, you know, you got to go to Australia and you have a limited right. amount of time when you're over there. And, and so, you know, I'm not a herpetologist, so, you know, that makes it a little difficult and I'd probably be better suited, you know, studying something in my own backyard. And so I think that's, that is definitely an opportunity. Uh, it's, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, but <laughs> at the same time, you know, we need to enjoy the green grass we're growing here and, and appreciate, you know, what we've got and, and maybe help, you know, discover new things. I'm, I'm looking forward to retirement when I can just go, you know, up the Canyon every morning and, and watch a, a great basin rattlesnake, you know, and just follow it around and take notes and, you know, publish right. information that that would be kind of a, a fun way to do that. And I, you know, there's people, I, I remember going with uh, Frank Reedy's. He was, he did that with Gila monsters. He's down in Tucson and he would just go mm -hmm. out in the desert. And I mean, he had a whole collection of, of monitors and was very busy and, and he's, and so when I went out to visit him, I went out to look at his monitors and see how he's keeping those and see if I could replicate his success and things like that. But then he's like, well, let's go out to my field site, you know, and he, he, m m uh, my, my dad was with me. And so he blindfolded me and my dad and took us to his secret, you know, research spot where he yep. was following Gila monsters around. He's like, Oh, look under that rock. And you'd look under this, you know, in this rock crack and there'd be two Gila monsters next to you. We saw like five Gila monsters in one day. And this was in February, you know, it was pretty right. crazy. They're just, he, he knew where, where they lived and what they did and when they came out. And so, um, and it was really kind of a cool thing to, and, and not only that, but there were, you know, he showed us like Western diamondbacks mating and, you know, a liar snake and, you know, different places. He, he just kind of knew where things were and because he's out there every day, just walking around looking and observing and, mm -hmm. and monitoring things, you know? So I think that's uh, we've, we've got lots of opportunities to do citizen science and add to the knowledge, you know, that people have, we can make observations that maybe have never been made before. You know, that's, that's kind of fun to think about. I just, I'm talking to my wife that because we do the educational shows, it, most of it is much lower level than that, right? We're, we're talking to mm -hmm. elementary school children and so on and so yeah. forth. But we, we actually have been interacting with adults and, and doing different events uh, quite a bit more recently. Mm -hmm. And it's, 
it's so hard to convey or I don't, I don't, yeah, I guess. Yes. It's difficult for me to convey like to someone who is not into this. Right. And you don't have to be into reptiles. You, you know, maybe there's a person who knows where to find salmon that yeah. the same way he mm -hmm. can find a Gila monster or they can find mm -hmm. sparrows or, or whatever it is. Yeah. And to convey to your average person how unique and rare and special mm -hmm. having that knowledge is yeah. not not just the thing like not just finding two gila monsters at one time under yeah. a rock that's really unique and rare and special yeah but yeah. the fact that there is a person somewhere out there in the ether that if you went to that person they can just go yeah it's over there yeah yeah that like that little nugget like is so special and so important yeah. and so unique. And there are probably thousands of hours of that person's life behind that. And I don't, it's just so hard to convey to people, yeah. you know, yeah. how cool that is, you know, mm -hmm. even just like my kids and I, we kayak a lot and uh, we have a kayaks and a canoe. And we were trying to explain like, oh, if you're sitting up at the canoe, it's a little easier to see down because of the angle. And do you see more stuff? Mm -hmm. And and they all like to kayak because they want to be on their own and do their own boat, you know. <laughs> and and I was it's like, you know, trying to convey to them the same thing. Like you you don't understand what you're missing, yeah. you know, because yeah. when you look down and see, you know, that certain there's, you know, mud turtles and things around here that they don't swim. They walk along the bottom mm -hmm. and lots of people know that like that's a you know they're dumpy little turtles that <laughs> do you actually know how they do it like have you ever seen them jog like that and so on and so forth and it's like because the part of the world where they do that you can't survive because hmm. you can't hold your breath and breathe underwater hmm. and they can yeah like it's yeah. it's a it's it's unique and special yeah. and uh. and to be that one person out on a lake in a canoe like a weirdo who gets to see that <laughs> like to, to convey that that might only happen twice this year because nobody yeah. else in this lake is looking. There's probably <laughs> 2000 mud turtles here though. Yeah. And me and one other, we doing it all the time. There, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. and it's like me and one other guy who accidentally saw it while he was fishing uh -huh. are, the, are the people <laughs> that saw it this year. Well, I, I remember when I was, you know, uh, younger, I was in, I think I was still in high school. Um, and there was a, a herpetologist at the university of Utah, which was about an hour South of where I live, where I grew up. And so I wanted to go talk to this herpetologist and kind of find out maybe I could get into his lab or, you know, do my herpetology degree in, at the U of U. And so I, I went and visited him and he was really gracious, kind of showed me around his lab. And, and he told me some stories that I've just never forgotten that just stuck in my head. And I thought was the coolest thing ever. And I'm like, that is the coolest job ever. But he was researching these turtles and he'd heard, you know, he was a turtle expert and he had heard these rumors of, of a turtle in Australia that, it, that was found in this one area and nobody had ever really seen it. And so he's like, he, he kind of staked out the, the area um, where the locals had told, yeah, there's turtles there and, and you know, you just don't see them. And he sat and watched the water for hours and didn't see a thing. And then he saw one surface, you know, and he's like, Oh, you know, and so they went searching the pond for these turtles. And he's like, how are, how are you never seeing these things? You know, how are they never coming up for a breath? And so he saw one down and he was swimming down. And so he swam and, and was able to grab it. And he, you know, he was almost running out of oxygen. You know, he, he had to go back up for air and this thing had grabbed a, a root and was holding on to the root system. And, and so he's about ready to run out of air and have the let go of the turtle and just try again later or something. And he looks down and all of a sudden the cloaca of the, the, you know, the turtle's tail opens mm -hmm. up and he sees these gill filaments inside and he's like, Oh, that's new. That's something. <laughs> and he's yep. like, okay, I'm not letting that's go, how. you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yep. how they're staying there. So he, 
you know, kind of wrestled it and barely got up to the surface with this turtle and, and, you know, before he expired and, and, and he showed me, you know, the turtle that was in a tank and in his lab, yeah. was like, this is one of them, you know, and like, whoa, you know, just mind blowing that you can go out and discover some crazy new thing in, you know, in the nineties you know, that was, yeah. was, you know, that, that wasn't too, too long. And maybe he'd discovered it before that, you know, but you know, I, I learned about that in, in the nineties and just, fascinating information you know so there's there's lots of things that we just don't know and cool discoveries waiting to be made and you know if you if you're not out looking or you're not out appreciating what's in your backyard you're probably going to miss those things you know? sure well look even in our country the the sirens that they recently mm -hmm. discovered that they're yeah. fairly big and, and leopard spotted mm -hmm. and it was it was published and and accepted as a species and so on and so forth yeah. and it the people that live there knew that yeah. Like that. Yeah. It was always a, a rumor. And uh -huh. then folks went to study it. And that's kind of the part that it was in the in, in several articles. They they did talk about it, but it kind of was glossed over a little bit. Yeah. Was by what they meant when they said we went there and studied it was they just went where those things lived and asked the people who live there where yeah. they were at. And uh -huh. they're like, oh yeah, in, in Jim's pond or whatever, <laughs> wherever it yeah. was. Like yeah. they knew they were like, yeah, they're huge and they have spots. You guys have never <laughs> seen those. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, no, this is a new <laughs> thing. And they're like, oh, uh, it's not new to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's pro like the, the, you know, the aboriginals or, you know, the, the native Americans or whatever, they probably knew about it for right. hundreds of years before like, that. Yeah, the, you know, the like, weird turtle yeah. hole. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <Weird>. Okay. <laughs> the, yeah. The, um, we, we were, uh, you know, it, the Gurnia species, right? The, the spiny tailed yeah. schemes, um, the depressa complex, right? There were uh, a group of them that were confiscated by the um, San Diego zoo. And so we were down there and we asked kind of, Hey, what about this? And they said, Oh, they're on display. So we went and looked at them and this was before this split had been made. And we, you know, everybody kind of thought, okay, there's different types of these things right. and they're probably different species. And so, you know, herpetoculturists kind of knew about that, but it hadn't been formally recognized by science. And so we go look at them in the display and they just put all of them in together because they're all depressive. So they all mm -hmm. should be, and, and you know, you had the, the reds on one side and the corals on the other side and they were like segregated and, and they told us, Oh yeah, they've been fighting. We're not sure what to do with them. Right. And, and we're yeah, like, they knew separate <laughs> them. Yes. Yeah, there's different, they're not the same thing. You know, they're different species, probably separate them into different enclosures. That's what you need to do. You know? Yep. And I, I, they're like, Oh, they're fine. They're fine. Well, no. Oh my gosh. Why did they confiscate these things? <laughs> the people who had them probably knew much better what they were doing than, than the, than the zoo knows here. So, you know, they're yeah. they're and, and then shortly after that, they were shown to be very different and, and separate species. And they're geographically isolated in different parts of you know Western Australia. So, you know, that was kind of uh, interesting to see. You know, same For thing sure. with the the Wheeler eye, the Nephurus uh, Wheeler eye and Nephurus cinctus that are now yep. separate species. But, you know, very different morphology. But, you know, the ranges come pretty close into contact. So it seemed like they were pretty um, closely related. So they've always been subspecies, but then, you know, somebody does the research, the actual DNA work and things, and they show, no, these are pretty different. They're pretty uh, significantly different in, in a lot of ways, uh, morphology and, and genetically. So yeah, they're different species. Green tree. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's a lot of examples of that where it's, I, I like that term, uh, cryptic speciation or cryptic diversity right. where, you know, they look the same or they act the same or they fill the same niche. So everybody just goes, Oh, yeah they're the same thing you know sirens uh he's got spots but it's just a siren you know yep. no this is different this is a and an actually a cool discovery you know and you know uh, well, i always if, think it's funny that we so like for green trees right mm -hmm. it that was when when natush in the in the, in the, the paper and, and things started to get separated out and so on and so forth and there was kind of like some debate in her pediculture and, and what have you and mm -hmm. It was that whole thing was always funny to me because I, I listened to an interview with him and mm -hmm. and was able to read some of the stuff that, that he had uh, published and, and different things. And and to it was just crazy to me when people would would, you know, debate him or, or what have you or really anybody from from that part of the world. And then they, like his answer was always like, you ever seen one? 
<laughs> yeah. And everybody, you know, like myself included is like, well, no. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, the thousand that I found, here's where I was at. And, you know, like, yeah, that it, I can be certain of my knowledge 2000 miles away. Yeah. And when that, <laughs> right. and when, and when that person <laughs> stands there and goes, no, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. It's, it's sometimes okay. it's hard to take, <laughs> not take that personally or be like, wait a second. I know what I know. And you know, you're wrong, <laughs> but yeah, it's right. like, why are you arguing with the expert? That might be your first clue. You know, that something's well, off, and, but and yeah. just the, the idea behind the, the physical observation of mm -hmm. no, no, I stood there and picked it up. I know yeah. where I found it yeah. you know? yeah. or, or yeah. even <laughs> Australian folks that give us a hard time about how we label carpet pythons and things. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. and they're like, Hey man, that's just where we mail it from, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever, yeah. you know, and, and there's bunches of stories through the history mm. of her pediculture, you know, Timor pythons. Yeah. People yeah. are like, Oh, you mean lesser Sunda pythons? And they're like, no, 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 Timor pythons. And they're like, yeah, man, there's no you know, snakes there. Term. Yeah, yeah. The pygmy <laughs> pythons, a, perthensis, yeah. you know, they don't you, range You get a bunch birth. of us yeah. who are like, what? Yeah. And they're like, yeah, man, that's where the FedEx hub is. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? We've never been there, you know? And, and yeah. that small observation of anybody who lived in Timor would have been like, what are you talking about? We don't. There's, no, there's that's, none of those yeah. here. Yeah. And it, all yeah. you had to do was ask one of them, you know, and, yeah. and we just never thought to do that. <laughs> well, that was, that was one of the biggest things writing the carpet book. It was, um, you know, we had this idea of, okay, this locality looks like this and this locality looks like this. And you can easily identify them based on where you find, you know, where they're right. from or whatever. And, and then getting over there and seeing like, oh, wait, that doesn't look like the one that's supposed to be from this area, or that looks nothing like I thought it would, or, you know, and you start seeing more pictures, and, you know, I love, you know, iNaturalist and, and Flickr, you know, you can, often they'll include the locality of the animal they're photographing in the wild, yep. and so you, you see how diverse even one area can look, and I think that's, you know, one thing I, I tried to do with the, the Knobtail book, is I had, you know, I, there, there's one page in there that I had pictures of like six different individuals of Occidentalis, Nefertis Levis Occidentalis, that I found in in um, the area of Coral Bay, kind of between um, Coral Bay and and uh, uh, up north a bit of that. And so we were driving, we kept seeing them. I mean, there were we probably saw fifteen or twenty that night. You know, they were everywhere on the road, and wow. it was almost to the point like, oh, it's just another knobtail. I'm like, wait, what am I saying? Of course, I'm going to stop <laughs> and look. At, it's a knobtail, yeah. you know. I don't care how many I've seen, and so, um, but you know, we we have the those six different, and they have six different looks. You know, they look very unique and different, and yeah. colors and patterns, and so you know, there's there's a quite a diversity of different place, you know, and it, even within the same locality. And, and there's also, you know, in, with green trees, you think, okay, the ones with the blue, you know, diamonds are from this area and the ones with the white spots down their vertebrae are this area, but you can find those pattern elements all the way through New Guinea right. and Australia. You know, there, there's a, there's a mix and, and yeah, you might see one type more prevalent, prevalently in an area, but you get those looks all across the range. And so, you know, to say, this is how it is, you know, that, that dogma that we try to establish because we like to label things and we like things orderly, you know, and, and once that gets thrown out the window, you're like, Oh, what am I left with? It's, there's no firm ground. I, you know, it could look like anything. <laughs> so, right. you know, it, I can't tell people they're wrong, that their, their diamond isn't pure because it doesn't look exactly like this. Right. <laughs> so, That's... Yeah. Which, which is kind of a yes. nice thing. And, and I, and I, I love the diversity of carpet python. That's one of my favorite things about them, you know, is their natural looks and how diverse they can be across their range. Yeah, for sure. Well, and it, especially it, it gets a little, a little more difficult when you talk about her pediculture and it, particularly with Australian things is that we, we lose sight of the idea it's like jungles, right. Mm -hmm. and, and how yeah. it's, if you are, if you're knowledgeable about, about carpet pythons, it's always kind of a joke, you know, and that like, Hey, they're not all black and yellow. And, and, you know, it, it's, it, we made it that way. And it's kind of <laughs> yeah. an Americanized version and what have you. And it, but it, I don't think it occurs what well, it, it might a little bit. Cause we, 
we do kind of talk about it when you listen to NPR and folks like that, but it, it kind of permeates her pediculture, right? Of, yeah. Hey, they don't all look like that. And it's like, well, they all do here, you know? And it, <laughs> yeah, it, it just gets so rooted that yeah. it, it's hard to break that when I can't give you like in your hands, give you an example and, and help you understand, you know, because, yeah. Because I, I can't get them. You, well, you know, and that, and that then, was one of the goals of the book is to give that photographic, right. you know, diversity and show this is yes. the looks you see, even in the same small area. You know, you can see all these different types. We do Latin jungles, everything's all black and white, you know, they're black and white. No, there's all sorts of, you know, different appearances. The black and white is probably the most popular or the one that's most desired right now, but that's not the only look you find there. And so, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I'm sure that goes with all sorts of different species. And, you know, there's some that are pretty uh you know they're across the board they look the same if you've seen one x you've right. seen them all kind of thing but with sure. carpets and different you know species of gecko and things they're there they can run the range of different appearances which yeah. you know i think adds a nice layer to it why do you want everything to look exactly the same <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's what started to make them and continues to make them so popular. I mean, is mm -hmm. that you can, yeah. if you are a Moralia nerd, you can have a really diverse collection of snakes that yeah. is maybe not diverse in care, not as diverse, I mm -hmm. suppose. And while mm -hmm. still has sizes and colors and, and pattern and, and, and diversity in ways that you can appreciate visually and still kind of keep a pretty nominal setup of, of how yeah. things are kept alive, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's just so many cool, cool things out there to learn and to, to discover and to, you know, for sure. Uh, I, I, lo I just love it, learning new things or, or things that I didn't know before. That always just gets me really excited about this. And I think if that stopped, you know, the, the excitement or the interest would probably slow down as well, you know, but there's always something new. Right. So it always stays interesting and exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that's her pediculture in a nutshell, right? There's, yeah. there's just yeah. so much that, <laughs> you know, you're never done for sure. So yeah. we are cruising toward an hour and 20. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we even talked about lizards yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we kind of steered all over the place to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So to kind of wrap things up, um, mm -hmm. where, can folks find you when I do the episode, I will make sure to do the website because is that probably the easiest place to find the books you think is to go through uh, your website? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a form on there. You can kind of fill out if you're interested in getting a copy of the book. Um, okay. I'm, you know, I'm on Facebook under Justin Julander, or, you know, you can uh, contact me under the Australian addiction reptiles, Facebook page, uh, my website, Australian addiction.com. Uh, I'm, I'm on, uh, uh, Instagram, but it's mostly just pictures of wild reptiles. And I subscribe <laughs> to people who post wild reptiles so I can see just wild stuff in the natural environment. But so don't okay. be offended if I don't follow you back on some of those things, uh, it, just because that's, that's kind of what I have that platform for is just to look at pretty pictures of wild animals. But um, so probably Facebook Messenger is probably the best way to get a hold of me if you're interested okay. in anything I've got going. <laughs> And then uh, please make sure to plug your podcast because I think it's cool. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, Reptile Fight Club. Uh, we we discuss diff the you know two two sides of, of a given topic within herpetoculture. So we've had some fun discussions. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll get some more uh, going in the near future. And we've uh, got an invitation out to Bill, and <laughs> he's he's uh, accepted the invitation. So we'll have him on as soon. Yeah, as it's going to be awesome can schedule it yeah so should be fun but it's uh it's been fun doing it i i co-host it with uh, chuck poland and uh he's got some great insights and he's fun you know fun guy to to talk to and debate with so um sometimes it's us sometimes we have guests on but yeah we usually cover a an interesting topic so well yeah. i also think it's funny that it we we kind of talked a little bit before we went live of how folks maybe thought it was going to be more like argumentative, I guess. Yeah. And it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it really isn't, but yeah. it, 
like I've you guys have actually kind of given each other a hard time here and there during episodes <laughs> about like, hey, you know, that's a point for me, right? Like yeah. you're, you're helping me. And, but I think that that's awesome because it some of the debates we have in her pediculture are important, like mm -hmm. of how, you know, animal welfare or, or how to better their lives and things. And some of them are maybe an important topic, but kind of devolve into your personal opinion. Yeah. And yeah. when you guys debate those things and end up pointing out the fact that you are making one another's arguments and, and helping each other's argument, it kind of shows that like maybe it, it's not that important for you to get upset <laughs> about, you yeah. know, and that, yeah, there's some facets of this that make sense and some facets of that that make sense, but yeah, kind of do your own thing. You, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of it that can be just personal choice or, or mm. your best judgment. And I think the way that you guys go about that, where it's, it's not argument, it's not actually argumentative. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's an actual debate yeah. and that you acknowledge like, Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Or, or that was, that's to my point and, and things like that. Yeah. It, it actually helps the discussion I think in her pediculture mm -hmm. move forward because two people that are very, very knowledgeable are kind of getting on the same track, despite the fact that you flipped the coin and took the opposite side, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you make good points, but you're also like, Hey, I don't hate this guy. I just <laughs> am talking about lights or whatever. Yeah. You know? Well, and I mean, you can, you can just dis disagree and, and still see, um, fair points on the other side. And, you know, even if we don't necessarily agree with the side we're, we're arguing for, there are still some valid arguments on the other side, or at least some cautionary tales or things to avoid or things to be careful about. Um, you know, I, I, in a lot of these debates, we usually side on the same side, but we have common interests and, and but, you know, other, other times we can be, you know, diametrically opposed and still come to the consensus of, we don't have to hate each other. You know, we can have right. different opinions or, or different things that support our point of views. And that doesn't make you wrong or me right. Or, you know, I don't have to lord it over you or something, you know, we can be friends and, and move forward. And I think that's, what's lacking in, in our society today. You know, you've got to be Democrat or Republican you got to follow them and, you know, fight against the other side and they're the idiots. And you're, you're the only ones that have all the good answers and they're just dumb and they don't know what they're yep. talking about. You know, I just get sick of that. I mean, it's, it, I, I look at these things like two sides of a, um, argument or two political parties. I look like it, like it, uh, as I do a marriage, you know, if, if you're always right and your spouse is always wrong, how long is that marriage going to last? <laughs> you're not going to last. Long, you know? Right. And so you've got, there's, there's some give and take and I there's good ideas on both sides. And... <laughs> are saying that as a married guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would admit that as a married guy. That, yeah. And I actually, I think my wife even said yesterday she was wrong and that I was right. And it was a, it was a beautiful moment. <laughs> <laughs> you got to appreciate those wins when you have them. But yeah, <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I, I think that's the same thing. We've got to not be so dogmatic in our stances. You yeah. know, we need to appreciate the other side and to see what the other side is even offering. Because most times we like have it. Oh, we've got it all figured out. I know I'm right. And my side is the right side and everybody else that opposes us or disagrees with us is just dumb or uneducated or whatever. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, they might have a great reason why they uh, oppose what you're looking at or the way you see things. And, and if you don't listen to them, you just remain ignorant. You know, you just right. remain in this little echo chamber, you know, that, that just says, yeah, you're right. You're a good guy. You know, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to worry about anything else. And, and I think that's dangerous. You know, that's what leads us to well, and I think it bad times it helps that the two of you are so experienced and so knowledgeable because that both sides and I, cause I've listened to every episode except the one that just came out. Cause I oh, have thanks. a commute yeah. tomorrow. So uh -huh. <laughs> um, both sides are well articulated. And so even if I didn't agree with, with one of them, it is well, it's well thought out and, even though like you guys are kind of stuck on the fly, like you get <laughs> stuck, you know, on the spot, yeah. It, yeah. it, you articulate it well enough that anybody who's listening should hopefully be able to go, Oh, that's why they said that. Or, Oh, that's why they like tubs. That's why they like <laughs> naturalistic. That's why they yeah. like 
whatever light or, or what have you. And I don't like that. I don't like that light. I don't like that mm. tub or, or whatever your thought process was when you listened. The, the counterpoint was always articulated well enough that I think that will help a lot of people. It, and even if you don't necessarily change their opinion of just like broadening a perspective is have something explained well enough, hmm. you know, not, hmm. not screamed at them, not blasted on a Facebook post <laughs> of yeah. explained in a, in a well thought out manner and then fleshed out in this discussion of the episode. And it, I don't know. I, I think that's going to help a lot of people to, to better absorb that information. But at least I hope it does. I'm I'm glad you you know you see it that way because that's what we we're shooting for. You know that's <laughs> that's really encouraging. We'll we'll keep it up because yeah that's that's the idea and uh, you know just getting the two sides to every coin out there and have people make their own decisions. You know we're yep. not trying to force you into anything or make you believe one way or another. We want you to do what's best for the animals and you know, what's best for our, our, our society, you know, as herpetoculturalists, we want to keep doing this. And so, you know, help, help uh, people get, see what the other side is and, and appreciate that for what it's worth and then decide what you want to do. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, the kind words and, and uh, understanding what we're yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoy it. And so um, hopefully <laughs> more folks will will find out about it and it's yeah. i think it is a big deal also that you guys are with the npr folks and that it's going to help you know i yeah that That's can only help a... help help broaden your audience definitely um, i mean which is uh, fantastic eric and owen have, have built an you know built and and under <laughs> intense work i mean it takes a lot to to do this day in, you know week in and week out to put out an episode over 10 years now. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. So, or 11 or whatever they're on now, you know, it just, they just keep going and it's, and, and, you know, that's a lot of work and that's a lot of effort and, you know, they built kind of an empire and, and now they're able to kind of pull others in and have us, you know, have almost an automatic uh, fan base, you know, that goes along with what they've already done. So we're again, standing on the shoulders of giants and, right. you know, trying to add some good content to, to help, uh, bolster what they're already doing so yeah fun stuff though awesome yeah, yeah. all right man well that was episode 18 uh, i really appreciate you coming on yeah happy to be here thanks for having me bill all right, all right. All thanks right. bye okay that was episode 18 uh that was awesome i am gonna put in the show notes the website for you guys to find out where you can find justin's books I have three of them. Uh, I wasn't able to get the complete carpet python. It is very hard to find. Uh, but I encourage you guys to check all that out. Um, his social media is full of tons of Australian reptiles. So if that's your jam, please uh, follow him and check that out uh, at your leisure. And it is always a funny thing because I'm on the Herpeticulture Network, which you guys know. but And he's on Morelia Python Radio Network. Uh, it's a really good podcast. I encourage you guys to give it a listen. Give it a follow. Uh, it is absolutely worth your time. So I will see you again in two weeks. Later. <laughs>